see you all here today for our worship service. Uh, I don't believe I have too many special announcements. Everything that you need to know for this upcoming week is going to be in your bulletin. Uh, one thing to look out for uh, that's coming up that didn't get listed is I believe we're going to be having a church council meeting this upcoming Thursday. Uh, we'll be trying to text out that information to everyone who needs to be there. So uh, be paying attention to your phone if you're on church council for the time and the place for that. Uh, other than that, again, no special announcements. So God's service to the word in the word begins as we ring the bell and we sing our opening hymn. kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you Alleluia Alleluia Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ. Alleluia. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship Him. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, 
and the great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his for he made it. And his hand formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh, come, let us worship Him. In the way of your testimonies, I delight. How can a young man keep his way pure? With my whole heart, I seek you. I've stored up your word in my heart. Blessed are you, O Lord. With my lips, I declare. In the way of your testimonies, I delight. I will meditate on your precepts. I will delight in your statutes. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the way of your testimonies, I delight. stand even when steeples are falling crumbled have spires in every land but still are chiming and calling calling the young and old to but above all the souls distressed, longing for rest everlasting. Surely in temples made with hands, God the Most High is not dwelling. temple stands all earthly temples excelling yet he who 
dwells in them above chooses to live with us in love making our bodies his temple we are God's house of living stones built for his own habitation he threw baptismal grace us owns as of his wondrous salvation were we but to his name to tell yet he would deign with us to dwell with all his grace and his favor And what his supper here gives us. Here's some the scriptures that proclaim Christ yesterday, today the same, and evermore a redeemer. God, your will be done, that when the church bells are ringing, many in saving faith may come, where Christ his message is bringing. I know my own, my own, know me. You know the world my face shall see. My peace I leave with you, amen. The Old Testament reading for the 24th Sunday after, or sorry, the 21st Sunday after Pentecost is from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them? With his eyes, sweet is the sleep of the laborer, whether he eats little or much but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil, just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all the days, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation, in sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for that is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not re much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. O Lord, have mercy on us. 
The epistle is from Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter, be, enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from the works, from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, in discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. O Lord, have mercy on us. We rise to the reading of the Holy Gospel, which is according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last in the last first. O Lord, have mercy on us. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Please be seated, and I'd like to invite the children forward for a children's message. Well, good morning, guys. Good morning. How are you all today? Good. 
good. Are you good? Good. Glad to hear it. Today we're going to keep talking about this little book. Catechism. Right. It's the catechism. And the catechism tells us everything that we need to know about being one of Jesus' disciples. And you guys are Jesus' disciples because you love him and you want to do the things that he wants you to do and know the things that he wants you to know. So today we're going to keep talking about the commandments and we're going to have commandment number five. And this is commandment five. You shall not, repeat after me, you shall not not murder. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. Who here gets angry? We all get angry from time to time, don't we? Maybe our little brother's picking on us, or our big brother's picking on us, taking our toys. Maybe it's the same with our big or little sister, right? We get angry at those. We get angry from time to time. And sometimes, though, we want to hit, right? If someone gets... If someone's bugging us or bothering us, we want to hit them. But that's not what Jesus wants us to do, right? Jesus wants us to live at peace. Jesus wants us to use our hands, not for hitting, right? Everyone look at your hands. These are wonderful, wonderful gifts that God has given us. And we can do so much, so many wonderful things with them. What Jesus doesn't want us to do is hit people with them. What, do you, what are some good things that we can do with our hands? Yes? Evie? Um, grab our cups with it. Right, right. What else? What are some good things that we can do with our hands? Yeah. Make houses for people. You can make houses for people. That's right. We can use our hands to hold tools and build things for people. What else, Clara? Um, helping people. Yeah, we can help people with our hands. You know what a great way to, to help people with their hands? This is what I like to do. This is what I like. Yeah, you can use our hands to give people high fives, right? Instead of hitting people, you can give people fist bumps. You give me a fist bump. Right? Those are wonderful ways that we can use our hands to help people. Because it's not, we don't want to just not hurt people. We want to use our hands to make people feel good and help and support them. So that can be doing little things like giving someone a slap on the back saying, hey, it's good to see you today. Or even doing bigger things like building people houses. Or if we know that someone's sick, using our hands to help take care of them. Maybe bring them some food or some soup or something like that or giving them a blanket. So that's what God wants us to do. Not use these wonderful gifts of hands to hurt people, but use these wonderful hands that he gave us to help other people. So that's what commandment number five is all about. And commandment number five is this. Repeat after me. You shall not murder. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, help me use my hands to help other people. Because you helped me, and you love me, and I love you. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up, guys. grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word of God that engages us today is our gospel reading from Mark chapter 10. I'm going to reread one verse. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. We don't like those words. 
very much, do we? Right? These may be the words of our Lord and Savior, but we don't really want to cuddle up next to them and get familiar with them too much. Because we want our cake and we want to eat it too. Right? We want to be rich in this world and to be able to enter into the kingdom of God, that is to have eternal life. Yet Jesus here gives a pretty stern warning that wealth, physical wealth, in this world might actually threaten our everlasting salvation. And for us, it should bring us into a kind of almost a point of crisis to make us ask ourselves those questions. Well, how am I thinking about my wealth? And how am I using it or not using it in a way that Jesus wants me to? So this sort of crisis isn't just us, but it's also the disciples in our text. Right? The disciples felt the exact same way. We return to uh, our story for today. It says, and the disciples were amazed at his words. Now amazed mean like. Like they were like, oh, that's so cool and so impressive. I've never heard anything so wonderful before. No, these people, they're kind of shocked that Jesus would say something like this. Like when someone talks back to you and you can't believe the words that are coming out of their mouth, you're just like, oh, can you believe what he just said? And while we might feel the same as the disciples, in reality, they were amazed for a different reason than we are. You see, this story falls on the heels of the gospel reading that we had last Sunday, which was the story of the, the rich young man. Remember when Jesus tells him to go and sell everything that he owns and give to the poor, and then, that young, and then follow him. And then the young man goes away sad because he had great wealth. You see, that story is key to helping us understand what's going on here in our gospel reading for today. Both that rich young man and our disciples in this text have a shared cultural assumption about money. Simply put, everyone back then thought money was good. In fact, they believed that money was so good that they believed that God actually loved the rich more than he loved the poor. And then the next shoe to drop was that if you had money, if you were wealthy... It meant that you were doing okay spiritually and you were doing all the things that God wanted you to do. But Jesus just blows that thought process just right out of the water. According to Jesus, wealth isn't a sign that God loves us more. Wealth isn't even something that's just spiritually neutral. Material wealth in this world is actually like a caged or a wild animal, if you will, that we're keeping at a, as a pet that at any time could turn on us. Wealth is dangerous to us. The thing is, we don't think that way, do we? We don't think the same way as the disciples did. I don't know really anyone who would think that if you're rich, it means that God loves you more. And since that's the case, since most people think, well, God loves everybody the same, we might think that we are free from that warning. It doesn't actually apply to us. And we begin tempted to simply, since we think we're free of that danger, to just go on our merry way trying to earn as much money as we possibly can to make ourselves secure and happy. The thing is, Jesus won't let us kind of sneak away out from underneath his warning. And so he kind of piles it on. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Kind of hard to dodge that, isn't it? The thing is, Jesus isn't doing this because he's mean or that he's hard on us. We've got to understand the heart of Jesus in this passage. Did you catch how it was that Jesus addressed his disciples and how he addresses us in this text? He calls us children. So it's out of Jesus' 
love and care and concern for you that he warns you to stay away and to be careful when it comes to material wealth. And the danger of it was so clearly presented in our reading from Ecclesiastes that the one who pursues after wealth, or the one who desires nothing but money, will never be satisfied for money. It's one of these things that it just consumes and consumes until it takes over our entire life. He cares for us. Jesus knows that there is something spiritually dangerous about wealth, and so he doesn't want us to to fall into the trap. I honestly think that our day is a fulfillment of Jesus' words here. It's no surprise that, and it's no secret, that the Christian church in America is in a slow decline. And that's across every type of Christian. So whether they're liberal or conservative, whether regardless of their denomination, all the Christian church in America is shrinking steadily. Now, that being said, like we sang, we always do need to remember that the church will stand. The church will always be there and the gospel message will be proclaimed even if there's just two of us gathered. And so we don't need to be afraid that the church is going to disappear. But we do need to recognize certain, uh, I guess, things that are happening in our society. But the thing is, the church may be shrinking here in America, but it's growing leaps and bounds elsewhere in the world. In underdeveloped countries, the church is exploding with growth. There are probably, there are by far more Lutherans in Africa than there are in America right now. By far. And the thing is, why is that the case? This might be an oversimplification, but I wonder if the reason that we're so kind of blah and why we're shrinking and why they're on fire is because we have money and they don't. You see, money, well, before we get to that, you might think to yourself, but I don't have money, I'm not rich. Because those other people are rich, but I'm not rich. Now, you might not be rich according to America's standards, but we always need to keep in mind something else, that to be born in America is like winning the world lottery. We have such a high, unprecedentedly high quality of living that, yes, in the world standards, each one of us can be rich, can be thought of as rich. Some of us just more than others. And that wealth that we have can act like a spiritual morphine. I was on that painkiller once, shortly after my appendectomy. I remember having that button in my hand, and then whenever I started to hurt, get a little uncomfortable, I could just press that button, and I could just feel this nice contentment flow over me, and I could just gently fall back asleep. Our wealth does the same thing. Our wealth and our reliance upon money to take care of us puts us to sleep spiritually. It washes over us and makes us so comfortable that we think that all that we need is just enough money in the bank account. We just need a large enough nest egg, a good enough job and income that we'll be set for life and we won't have any worries. We begin to think, or we begin to forget, rather, That money cannot save us from this broken world. Only God can. No matter how much money we have, we can't defeat sin. We can't make the world right. And we most certainly can't make ourselves live forever. And we forget that. We get so preoccupied on stuff and on things that we don't think about what our greatest need is and that greatest need is really salvation and deliverance from this fallen and broken world. And the reason why we fall into that is because we are injected constantly with spiritual poison. 
We're inundated and bombarded with it nonstop. Not one of us is untouched. I mean, what is the internet other than a giant advertisement? And so Jesus' words ring so very true as it did to the disciples, as it does to you and me. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person, we might say an American, to enter in the kingdom of God. And since that's the case, the disciples' question that they asked Jesus following that is our question. And so we want to know how he answers it. And they were exceedingly astonished. You might almost say that they were afraid for themselves. And they said, then who, Jesus, can be saved? If the rich can't be saved, then what chance do we have? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. But not with God. For all things are possible with God. You see, Jesus doesn't leave us in the lurch thinking that it's impossible for any of us to enter in the kingdom of God. We realize that we cannot save ourselves. We come to the truth of God's word that money can buy a lot of things, but it cannot buy life. And Jesus agrees with us that our money is a false dream and an empty idol that will leave us high and dry at the end of our lives. But the thing is, God saves you despite your wealth. You see, Jesus has sucked that spiritual poison out of you. And he's brought it into himself. Our preoccupation with our IRAs, with getting new clothes that we don't actually need and just sit in our closets unworn, nice new cars that we don't need, new technology and phones the second they come up, more land, bigger tractors, cable TV, whatever the case may be. He draws that from you and he puts it to death by dying himself on the cross. And he became poor so that you might become rich. Not with the riches of this world, but the riches, true riches, riches that will last into eternity, the riches of everlasting life in God's kingdom. Christ, in Christ, the camel has gone through the eye of a needle. The impossible has happened. And the rich, you, have entered into the kingdom of God. And praise God for that. But now we might be tempted to think that since Jesus has saved us, now we can chase wealth with abandon, right? Because, you know, we're free. You know, we can do anything that we want now. Again, that would be the wrong way of thinking about it. As if Jesus simply got us off the hook so we can continue to just do whatever we want. Instead of serving money, or acting as if our life was a non-ending pursuit of money, as subject to the kingdom, we now seek to obey our king. At the same time, we're honestly concerned. Right? Does following Jesus mean that we'll end up in the poorhouse? We want assurance from Jesus. That if we do give up this mad dash after wealth and getting enough stuff, that we'll be okay. That affirmation, this affirmation is the same thing that Peter wanted as well in our reading. Because after Jesus says this, this is how Peter responds. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, don't brag on yourself like you did something wonderful. He actually senses in Peter's word this desperate cry for for something that God's actually going to still take care of him and us as well. And so this is how Jesus responds with that beautiful assurance. He says, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time 
houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Indeed, being a disciple of Jesus, as Jesus well says here, doesn't put us out on the street. Instead, the things that we give up as a disciple, the pursuit after wealth that we give up on, that goal in our life, and all the things that we give up to receive that, Christ promises to repay for us and give us, and Christ honors his word in this time in the Christian church. For in this church we have a community of faith, we have a family who promises to help take care of each other and its fellow members in their physical needs in time of need. This is what we were talking about in the fifth commandment with the kids. We all strive together to support and help each other and in, in our neighbor in every physical need. So the Christian church works to make sure that there are people among our midst who do not go without. Now, it's true enough. The church falls pretty flat sometimes of that grand depiction that Christ presents for us. But how could it not? Because the church is full of sinners. But still, if you've gotten to see it before, as I have, you'll know it is an amazing thing to get to see the Christian church actually act like this and to help and care for people in their time of need, whether it's a a physical need, a spiritual need, or an emotional need. And besides that, When we follow after Jesus, he gives us something that beyond what the world could possibly give and possibly buy, eternal life. He will give us eternal life in a world where money simply has no meaning anymore. And it doesn't matter who's rich and who's poor because in that world, there will be no want. But if those promises weren't enough to steer us away, from chasing after wealth, he gives one final warning. He says, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Now Judas, the betrayer, definitely makes this true. He proves this out. Right? He was one of the first. He was one of the twelve disciples, and yet he fell away. He witnessed all of Jesus' miracles, all of these wonderful Signs that Jesus was God's Son and the Christ of God, but yet even He betrayed Jesus. In the same way, we need to be on guard that somehow we're immune to this, as if hearing a sermon or, or thinking to ourselves, now, today, I'm going to change my attitude on wealth. Now, everything's going to be different, and I'm going to just go gung-ho all the time and do it right. It doesn't mean that after you've left here that your wealth won't start putting you to sleep again. Because in truth, as I said earlier, we're bombarded with it in every possible way, and so we need to fight that. We need to do whatever it takes to make sure that wealth doesn't become our idol, it doesn't become our goal in life. So who knows what that means for you personally. Maybe it means turning off the TV or shutting your phone off for a little bit so you're not constantly bombarded by advertisements. Maybe it means uh, instead of thinking about all the stuff that you want, thanking God without ceasing for what you already do have. Or perhaps it could be even giving away some of the money that you do have because nothing could be a greater antidote to the danger of wealth than having less of it. And that doesn't necessarily mean just giving it to church, but giving it to the poor and the needy, helping with any number of charitable organizations that can help. Whatever you do in this, know that it's worth it. Because wealth is spiritually dangerous. For as Jesus says, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. So don't seek after wealth. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all that you need will be added unto you. Amen. And now we stand to sing the Te Deum.
praise you, O oh God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. All the earth now worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels, cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To you, cherubim and seraphim, continually do cry. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of your glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise you. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise you. The noble army of martyrs praise you. The holy church throughout all the world does acknowledge you. The Father of an infinite majesty, your adorable, true, and only Son. Also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. You are the King of glory, O Christ. You are the everlasting Son of the Father. When you took upon yourself to deliver men, you humbled yourself to be born of a virgin. When you had overcome the sharpness of death, you opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You sit at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that you will come to be our judge. We therefore pray you to help your servants whom you have redeemed with your precious blood. Make them to be numbered with your saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save your people and bless your heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify you, and we worship your name forever and ever. Grant, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let your mercy be upon us as our trust is in you. O Lord, in you have I trusted. Let me never be confounded.
in our prayers today, we'll especially be remembering Junior Shorter, uh, the husband of Virginia Shorter. Junior's cancer is not responding to his treatments as well as they would like, so they're going to be undergoing some a uh, little bit more aggressive treatments to try and uh, take care of that. We'll also give God thanks and praise for his great blessings in this life to Kay and Bernard as they celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. So let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. I invite you to rise for prayer as we sing the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. We pray. O oh God, your divine wisdom sets in order all things in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all things hurtful, and give us those things that are beneficial for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Father of mercies, God of comfort, our only help in time of need, look with favor upon your servant, Junior. Assure him of your mercy. Deliver him from the temptations of the evil one, and give him patience and comfort in his illness. If it please you, restore him to health, or give him grace to accept this tribulation with courage and hope. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of married life. On this day, we rejoice with Kay and Bernard as they observe their 60th wedding anniversary. Bless them in years to come so that they may remain faithful to, to you and devoted to each other. By your presence, gladden each day that you graciously grant them. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. and God of glory on your people pour your power crown your ancient church's story bring its bud to glorious flower grant us wisdom grant us courage for the facing of this hour. 
Lord for the facing of this hour. Lo, the hosts of evil round us scorn the Christ assail his ways from the fears that long have bound us free our hearts to faith and praise grant us wisdom grant us courage for the living of these days for the living of these days cure your children's warring madness bend our pride to your control shame our wanton selfish gladness rich in things mine poor in soul grant us wisdom grant us courage lest we miss your kingdom's goal lest we miss your kingdom's goal. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the gift of your salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving you whom we adore, serving you whom we adore. 